you. Thanks sir, for the introduction, Svetlana. Sorry, I was a bit distracted trying to get the laser pointer out. Um, good morning, everyone. So, uh, it's a very pleasure to be here today. Today, I'll be talking to you about the European Seismic Risk Model, so following on from Laurentius' presentation on the hazard model. And I'm hoping to focus, I'll try and focus a little bit on the Balkans, on the Balkan Peninsula, in terms of some of the model inputs and the results. Um, I was the, the coordinator, if you like, of this model, but um, we, I worked together with a large number of people, some of whom are mentioned on this slide. They are the co-authors of this, of this model, but as Lorenzo also showed, we have a link here to a web page with a large number of people who have all contributed. Some of you are actually here today, and we'll see later some of the names of the people specifically from this region who have helped us to develop this model. Um, I was here... I was here three years ago, uh, exactly, to the day. Uh, this is me uh, presenting in the same place. Uh, maybe I, I looked on the YouTube channel of Susie and found the, the presentations are up there. So if you'd like to go and see what we were talking about three years ago uh, when we first were presenting with this risk model, um, then, then do go there. We, I was also here with my colleagues from GEM, Vita Silva and Svetlana, who were also talking about uh, the global earthquake model. And here, here's a picture of us all. I hope Svetlana will manage to get another yes. photo like this before we leave. Um, uh, we're all obviously three years older, and as time goes, hopefully we'll, we'll have more and more of these photos in the future with more workshops. So what, just to give you a quick overview of what we have done since uh, I was here three years ago, just very briefly. So we had the workshop, which was specifically focused on in particular, getting input from this region to help us to develop the exposure model. So getting your feedback on what are the replacement values of the buildings, the building typologies. It was very, very useful for that. We had another uh, workshop. Uh, this was all being carried out as part of a project called SERA, the SERA workshop. So we had another SERA workshop in Istanbul um, where we had some very, very early risk results, so European risk results, which were shown to the community. And we also had an earthquake uh, training workshop then. The SERA project actually finished in April 2020, but uh, unfortunately the hazard and the risk models were not complete. So after the end of the, the SERA project, we had to continue to develop and to finalise these models so that they could be released to the community. So there was a lot of in-kind contribution and goodwill there for people to, to continue to work on these, uh, these models. We focused a lot in this time on testing the components at the end of my presentation I'll a little insight into what we do in terms of testing the uh, exposure and, and vulnerability models, so comparing losses um, that we get from the models with uh, past events. And, and while we were doing this, the hazard team were continuing to finalise and complete the hazard model. We also worked a lot on communication. Um, how should we communicate these hazard and risk products to a wider audience, not just to our scientific colleagues, but also to the media and to the public. And then uh, we were able finally to release in December last year all of the input data sets, the models, the final risk results uh, openly to the scientific community as well as technical reports both on the hazard and the risk. And then earlier, a few, a few months ago this year, we had a more public event uh, where we were able to engage the media and to make sure that we were um, communicating the release of these European hazard and risk models to, to the public. So I'm going to, as I mentioned, describe this, uh, you've seen this map now a couple of times, this is a seismic risk index map for Europe, so I'm going to describe now my presentation, how did we arrive at this final uh, seismic risk index map and focus in particular on, on how we got the results in, in this region. So starting from the hazard, uh, thanks to Lorenzo, we, you, you've had a very good insight into the hazard model itself, to the various components, the source zones, the ground motion models, and the final products in terms of those hazard maps, uniform hazard spectra, hazard curves. But I'm going to talk about how we actually use the hazard model in the, in the, the seismic risk calculations. Um, we didn't take the, the final products, those risk maps or those risk curves, and calculate the risk from them, but we take a step back and we actually use the source zone models and the ground motion logic tree. So we, we generate what we call, if you like, we call them synthetic catalogues. We generate synthetic catalogues and ground motion fields from those synthetic catalogues to calculate the risk. So we take the source mo model logic tree, the Laurentia has presented to us, and we sample, sample the logic tree because we, we need to reduce the computational intensity, uh, intensity. So we can't use all, all 
the full logic tree and the calculations of risk because we're adding in the, the exposure, the vulnerability, we're making the calculations more complex. Then what's called in, in OpenQuake terms, OpenQuake Engine is, is the tool that we use, the open source tool that we use, it's called an earthquake rupture forecast. So this is a list of all possible ruptures that could be generated with their annual probabilities of occurrence. So this is generated from the source model. And then again we sample that and we sample um, 10,000 what are called stochastic event sets. Again this is OpenQuake language. Um, each of those event sets is one year. If you like, you can think that of that as 10,000 years of seismicity. Or what if I repeat next year 10,000 times? What, would, what could the, the spatial distribution of earthquakes look like in terms of their magnitude, locations, and distances? And so this is what uh, 10,000 years of seismicity that we've produced from the source model logic tree could look like um, with one sample of the logic tree. You can't see uh, very well the earthquakes. There's, there's obviously a large portion of those lower magnitude fives, five and a half sixes, which are probably on top here of some of the larger magnitudes, but here at the edges you can see that we go all the way up to, to 8.65 magnitude. So we take then this um, synthetic catalogue, this catalogue of 10,000 years of seismicity, we pick each event in the catalogue and we then sample the ground motion logic tree, as Lanix has showed you, there's many branches to that logic tree, so we sample a branch and then with that model, we can produce what we call ground motion fields. That's just simply a, a spatial distribution of the ground shaking at different locations. Because we are calculating seismic risk, we're interested, obviously, in the ground shaking that goes into the building, so the, the ground shaking at the surface. And so we need to bring in a site amplification model to consider the, the site conditions underneath the buildings across Europe. We're obviously working at a very large scale, the whole European scale, um, so we can't do this with a lot of detail as you would do, for example, for a single building, design codes where you can actually measure the properties of the site and, and get a, a VS30 value, a measured VS30 value. So we have to use what we call proxies. And so uh, the proxy data that we use at the European scale, which, tell, which is, we have seen is correlated with ground shaking, uh, is the slope and the geological era. So we have these maps of, um, at the European scale of slope, and also of the geological era. And these are actually directly parameters of the ground motion model that has been developed for the for ESHM20 for shallow seismicity. So the um, I think on our Laurentia slides you showed the Koffer et al model. This is for shallow seismicity. And so rather than as you are typically you see VS30 as an input parameter into a ground motion prediction equation or ground motion model, instead slope and geological era are the parameters that we uh, that go straight into the, the ground motion model to um, to allow us to assess the, the amplified ground shaking at the surface. Because we're using these very simple, somewhat crude approximations to site amplification, we have an additional aleatory variability in our ground shaking, and this is all propagated in the analyses. There are some ground motion models in the logic tree that, um, that use instead VS30, some of the existing models, for example, for the subduction zones or the craton zones, the stable continental regions in Europe. So we did also need to have a model of VS30 across Europe, and so here we infer the VS30 from the slope using models such as, uh, well, we use the one of Wall and Allen. Um, and again, we increase our, our uncertainty, our variability in the ground shaking from the fact that we, we don't measure the VS30 at every single location, but we're inferring it from the slope. So that, that's the hazards, that's how we get, so we're at the stage of having amplified ground shaking for each event, for those 10,000 events. So now we bring in the exposure. So we were able to develop, um, over a number of years, exposure models for 44 countries in Europe, covering the buildings and their occupants. And so we have done this by collecting census data for countries all across Europe, public census data, by interacting with experts to obtain their expert input on some additional parameters, such as replacement costs of buildings, such as what are the building classes of residential, industrial, and commercial buildings in those countries countries as well. And so on the left here I'm showing you um, the, the resolution of the census data, of the residential uh, census data of different countries across Europe. As you can see it's very um, heterogeneous and, and e each country has uh, provides census data at very different levels of resolution in terms of 
administrative uh, units. Um, and then we have also used, so once we've collected the census data, which typically tells us about the number of dwellings or the number of buildings with material properties, maybe with numbers of stories, we then need to map that to building classes which, um, we, for which we know that the, they have distinct seismic performance. And so this is where our building taxonomy comes in, and uh, as Svetlana mentioned, uh, she is very much the lead in, in, in developing that uh, gen building taxonomy. I think it's one of the, the probably the, the best standards uh, that, that gen has proposed uh, globally. It's being used all around the world to classify buildings uh, in terms of uh, distinct attributes. Uh, this is just a, a small screenshot of the, of the full taxonomy. Um, but shows the, the, the attributes that we use to mainly to uh, classify our buildings in terms of building classes. So the most important ones being the material of the lateral load resisting system, the lateral load resisting system itself, um, and, and the number of stories of the building. Just to give you an overview of what's inside these uh, exposure models at the European scale, so we have assessed that there are 145 million buildings as I said, just residential, commercial, and industrial buildings in Europe. This is probably an underestimation because we started this work um, probably six or seven years ago, collecting the census data from 2001, as that became 2011. Apologies, as that became available. As you know, last year the census was, was updated, so we hope to repeat this uh, in the coming years, and I think we'll, we'll have a, a much larger number of buildings. Um, those buildings have been assessed to have value in terms of replacement value of 50 trillion euros and 66% of that value of the building stock is within the residential building stock. Um, this we've got here is just showing the countries uh, in terms of the number of buildings, which are the countries which have the most number of buildings. So Germany, United Kingdom, France, Italy, Spain, top countries in terms of numbers. And we assess that at any given time there are um, almost half a billion people inside buildings uh, at any given time. And before I showed you a, a figure, a map, which showed that the resolution of our exposure models at each country in Europe is, is very different. Uh, some countries we have very high resolution data and others it's very low. Ideally, we would have high resolution, such as this 30 arc second um, um, distribution of buildings for each country in Europe. This is, becomes very computation intensive to run the calculations uh, at such a high uh, resolution. We can try to disaggregate our exposure models onto, these high onto this high resolution using other data sets, satellite data, population data. Um, the problem is, as I say, it takes a long time to do the calculations. So we did a study to look at um, what would be the optimal uh, resolution that we could use so that we, we don't have too much bias in our in our results but we do uh, we are able to run the calculations quite quickly as we were developing the model we needed to run the model uh, quite quickly so in, in Spain we have the, the data of these administrative units so we need to aggregate all of the buildings at a given location within the administrative unit when running our calculations where do we put where do we place the buildings inside those administrative units? So that's what, what our study was, to look at different coordinates that we could use, and um, which was the coordinate that would give us the results that were as close as possible to when we had actually disaggregated onto a high resolution grid. Um, we found that, um, at least for the countries we looked at, the European scale, that using an urban density weighted average location, so taking, um, it was the Global Human Settlement uh, Layout Project, which is released by the JRC, um, which tells us about the urban density build-up, it's a very high resolution grid, and taking the um, weighted average location inside each administrative unit and using that both for the location at which we um, calculate our ground shaking and also taking a weighted average of the site properties in the unit um, gave us the results with the least bias. Another study that we did um, that was important to help us to better classify uh, particular reinforced concrete buildings across Europe was to look at the temporal and spatial evolution of seismic design codes um, and also the lateral force coefficients that were specified in codes. So going all the way back to 1900 or 1910 after the Messina earthquake where for the first time regulations were specified to 
apply a, a lateral force, which was a percentage of the weight of the building in the design. We discussed with colleagues, many of whom from, from this region, um, what has been the evolution of seismic design in your country? When, have, when was the very first design code introduced and how did that change? Um, so that that allowed us to um, understand the, on the left here you see the percentage of reinforced concrete buildings today uh, that have been designed according to different design codes. So we classified those codes as low code, moderate code and high code. Um, and then we also, for the low and the moderate codes in particular, we were able to look at spatially how within a country it was defined at what percentage of lateral force needed to be um, to be applied in design at different locations, so that seismic zonation, if you like. So this allowed us to, within our exposure model for the reinforced concrete buildings, to classify them also, not just in terms, as I showed before, as material, lateral code, resistance system, and number of stories, but also design code and the lateral force coefficient of the design code. Um, if we look at in a little bit more detail in, in the Balkans, uh, I'd like to thank all of these people who helped us to develop the exposure models. As I mentioned, many of you were, were here, and many of them were here three years ago in the workshop that we had. And, and many of them have also been um, co-authors of that paper, of a paper which described the evolution of design and design codes of lateral force levels in Europe. So this, this shows, I've just picked these countries as being, if you like, the main, the main countries in the Balkan Peninsula, and this shows the um, number of buildings, replacement costs and occupants in those countries. So uh, obviously Romania is standing out there as being a country with the highest number of buildings um, and the highest number of occupants inside buildings, but not necessarily when we look at the replacement cost. There, Greece um, has a higher value, higher cost, replacement cost of buildings, and so it overtakes in terms of the, the value of the building stock. Um, and then we also have, as you can see, Serbia being another country with a high number of people and uh, buildings, and also value in the building stock, and also Croatia. We can plot that same, uh, that same data, um, looking a little bit more in detail in, in how that that value or those occupants are distributed between different classes of buildings, so really residential, industrial, and commercial buildings. And, and as you can see, as I mentioned before, the majority of the value of the building stock is, is, in, is in the residential building stock in all, in all countries. Um, and also the majority of the people um, are, are within the residential building stock. That's the, the average number of people over a 24 hour period. We can also uh, look at what are the top, this is the top five building classes in, in the number of buildings. Um, we have taken the, the GEM taxonomy, which describes the buildings with a, quite a, a detailed classification. We've, we've grouped them into what I would call macro classes, and macro classes here in a, in a more of a human readable form, not using the GEM taxonomy attributes, but obviously unreinforced masonry, low rise, is dominating in terms of the number of buildings in the region followed closely by confined masonry and then concrete frame, reinforced concrete frames with infill panels, low rise buildings, but and designed to those very low, moderate codes, that like first generation of seismic design codes, and also some adobe and wood buildings. If instead we look at the, the occupants, it, it follows quite a similar um, distribution, at least for the first two classes, but then we, we see the mid rise reinforced concrete buildings uh, are more important. Obviously, those are buildings which can house a larger number. So they have a larger contribution to the, 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 the buildings, the, the occupant distribution. And then in terms of replacement cost, uh, here reinforced concrete buildings becomes the, the, the building class which has the largest contribution to the replacement cost in the region. And again, the mid-rise, obviously because those taller reinforced concrete buildings have more value. So moving on to the, the vulnerability models that we've developed. We, um, we start with capacity curves and we use an analytical procedure to calculate the vulnerability models. So the vulnerability models tell us about the probability of loss given a level of ground shaking. And we assess both economic loss and loss of life in the seismic risk model. So we, have, we start with capacity curves. We've put together capacity curves for over 500 building classes 
um, thanks mainly to the efforts of GEM, the Global Earth Grid Model, where they have developed a, a global seismic risk model and they produced uh, capacity curves for hundreds of building classes at the global scale. So we, we made use of those capacity curves for all of the building classes, except for the reinforced concrete frames and moment frames. And the reason that we, we didn't use GEMS curves is that we wanted to look at how the design code and the level of lateral force that we had studied in the exposure, how that affected the vulnerability so that we could better connect the exposure and the vulnerability models. So we developed um, 264 new capacity curves um, where each capacity curve was for a specific number of stories. Um, a code level, so that's no seismic design, low, moderate, and high level of seismic design, and for different values of lateral force coefficient from 0 up to 30%. So, once we, um, so the procedure to do this was to take a prototype frame and to do a simulated design of that frame using standard, typical uh, low, moderate, and high code with different levels of lateral force. And then once that design was undertaken, to then produce a model of that uh, prototype frame and do a pushover analysis to get the capacity curves. So once we have the capacity curves, the next step is to produce single degree of freedom models for each building class with those capacity curves. And then we run dynamic analysis with a set of records. And we use OpenSeas Pi, so that's the Python version of OpenSeas. So open software that allows us to do nonlinear dynamic analysis. This has all been coded up inside GEMS Vulnerability Models Toolkit. This is a, an open source set of scripts that are online on, on GitHub. So we were able to use these to, to run dynamic analysis for a specific building class, um, to look at the response of that building class in terms of the response to space and to different records which have different intensity properties, and then re regression analysis is carried out on that data, and from there we can look at the probability of exceeding different levels of displacement, different damage states, and get fragility models. Then we connect those fragility models to the loss through damage loss models. So, as I mentioned, we look at loss of life and economic loss. Um, our fragility models have different damage states, slight, moderate, extensive, and complete damage. We don't go all the way to collapse, but as we know, loss of life is correlated, connected with the collapse of the building. So we had to um, assess what is the probability of collapse given um, complete damage. We looked at empirical data, we looked at um, uh, damage databases, uh, also there's some expert judgment here on what is the probability of collapse given the fact that the, the, the building will be completely damaged. We looked again from past earthquakes, from past um, loss data, what's the probability that someone would be entrapped in the building given that it is collapsed, so they would be in the part of the building where they cannot get out. And then if they are uh, entrapped, what is the probability that they have loss of life? So the probability of fatality given entrapment in the building. And that allows us to develop a vulnerability model for loss of life. For the economic loss, we use the standard process of uh, what's often called damage ratios or ratios of cost of repair to cost of replacement. So for each fragility function, for each damage state, we multiply it by that cost of uh, ratio of cost of repair to cost of replacement and sum together. So putting all of these components together in the computation of seismic risk, the main risk metrics that we are, are of interest and that we've produced from this model are average annual losses and aggregate losses for specific return periods, where the aggregation can be at varying levels of aggregation. We can aggregate at administrative level one, we can aggregate at the country level, we can even aggregate at the European scale. So coming back to our synthetic catalogue, as I mentioned, we have 10,000 years of, of events in our synthetic catalogue. We take an event, as I mentioned before, we produce a ground motion field from that event. We then look at the buildings in the exposure model underneath that ground motion field take the vulnerability functions for the building classes inside the exposure model and so we can go with the value of ground motion into the vulnerability function, calculate the loss and then we can aggregate for that specific event what is the loss that's been uh, assessed. We do that for this full synthetic catalog 10,000 years, we have a large number of losses, we can rank them from the highest to the lowest and then for each one we can calculate how many times has that been exceeded in 10,000 years. 
and that allows us to calculate the annual frequency of exceedance which, from which we can get also the return period. And then also we can look at those 10,000 years of losses, we can calculate what's the average, and that would be our average annual loss. This is just to show you some uh, loss, what we call loss curves or loss exceedance curves, so, um, which is the return period against the, the losses. This is at the national scale, so this is for Italy, Turkey and Germany. From our loss model in terms of average annual losses, we estimate 7 billion euros at the European scale of average annual loss. So on average, each year we can expect 7 billion euros of loss. So that's not to say that we will have 7 billion euros every year. We'll have many years with no losses, some years with very high losses. And if we average that out over time, it's around 7 million. And 80% of that 7 million is just within four countries, Turkey, Italy, Romania, and in Greece. The same thing if we do look at it in terms of fatalities, on average, 900 fatalities a year. Uh, uh, there are 900 fatalities a year that can be expected in Europe due to earthquake ground shaking. Again, if we, we focus in uh, on these countries in the Balkans, we, uh, as expected, Greece and Romania are there at the top. They are not just the top in this region, they're, they're the top countries also in Europe, uh, driving the losses. Um, especially Greece driving the economic losses, uh, not unexpected given, as we saw before, the very high value of buildings in this region, in, in Greece. Um, we also have Bulgaria, Croatia, and, and even some Serbia not, not, uh, not having non-negligible uh, economic losses. If we then divide those losses by the replacement value of the buildings, of the exposure, we can calculate what we call an average annual loss ratio. So it's the ratio of the loss to the value of the exposure. And then we start to see a slightly different pattern in, in, in countries like Albania starting to, to pop up as having very high uh, relative risk. And then in terms of fatalities, even though Greece, as we saw before, has uh, high economic losses, um, it doesn't have as high uh, estimates of fatalities as compared to Romania. And then also Albania, Bulgaria, and, and even, even Serbia. North Macedonia have uh, and Croatia have, have non negligible uh, fatalities. This, this is the average annual number of fatalities. Again, looking at uh, how those um, losses and fatalities are distributed amongst the building stock, um, the residential building stock is, is always seen to be the main driver of the losses, especially for the loss of life. Uh, it really is the main. Because not just because people spend a lot of their time in residential buildings, but also because of their higher vulnerability. Uh, this is just to show you some of the loss curves that have been calcul calculated for each country uh, in this region. And then, yeah, let's look at the building classes that are driving the losses um, within those countries. Uh, looking at the economic loss, it is the mid-rise, low uh, infill panel concrete frames with very early design codes. Again, not unexpected given, as we saw before, they have uh, a large replacement value. Uh, followed by the unreinforced masonry buildings, and then uh, concrete frames with the low rise. Um, if instead we look at fatalities, uh, again it's the, the, the concrete frame buildings, uh, mid-rise, again driving the fatalities because they house a larger number of people and also when they collapse they can cause a larger number of fatalities. And then uh, unreinforced masonry and uh, uh, low rise. And, and here for the first time we see unreinforced masonry mid-rise being one of the top five typologies. We didn't see that before in the exposure. It wasn't one of the top five typologies in terms of replacement cost or in terms of occupants, but because of its high um, fatality uh, risk it comes it up as being one of the, the top drivers of fatalities in the region. So just a, a couple of slides talking about testing the risk model. We, as we were putting together all these components, as I mentioned at the beginning, we had to carry out a large number of tests. We have taken here past events uh, that have happened since 1980. We can't go too far back in time because obviously the built environment was very different, the value of the buildings was very different. Uh, so we, we can't go back too many years in the past, but if we go back to 1980, we can take an event that occurred, we can try and reproduce that event um, in terms of what was the, 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 the rupture of that earthquake, what were the um, ground 
motions, combine those with our exposure and vulnerability models and assess the loss. That's the loss today, if that event occurred today. Um, we can go into databases such as this is EMDAM, which is an open database which has um, observed losses, both economic and fatalities, and, and we can try and bring those losses up to today's value, so at least the comparison is, is, uh, makes more sense. And this is what you see, uh, each point there is a different scenario. You have these, these vertical lines, because this is showing the uncertainty in our prediction of the loss, um, which is mainly driven by the uncertainty in the ground motion. We don't know exactly what the ground motions was that the buildings were subjected to in those events, so we model that uncertainty. So we get quite a range of loss. Another thing we can do with these databases, such as EMDET, is produce a loss curve. So that's the, before I showed it to you in terms of return period on the x-axis, the loss on the y, this is just a switched round loss on the, on the x-axis, and rather than return period, annual probability of exceedance. But we can produce an empirical, which is the blue curve that you see there, empirical loss curve. Um, here we're using data from on losses, and it's only just from the past 37 years. It's not, it's not a very long time to go back in past to, to look at, uh, to produce an empirical loss curve, but it does at least give us some um, reassurance that the, the losses we are predicting, which is the mean, is the black line here, so the loss curves for the whole of Europe that we're predicting with our model is at least in line with what's been observed over the past 37 years. And then we have um, this repository here where we've put together a number of these tests, um, so past scenarios, and we have a number of scenarios which have occurred in this region. So we have looked at these events, we have identified uh, the characteristics of those events in terms of their magnitude, depth, coordinates, we've produced rupture models, um, we've collected also the observed loss data, and we've produced OpenQuake engine input files to allow you to rerun those scenarios events and see what, what predictions we are getting if those events were to occur today. Just a few words on, on communicating all of this information. So I've shown you this seismic risk index map at the, at the beginning. So we, we felt that it was important to have a single product that we could use to, uh, to communicate this seismic risk model. As I've shown you in some of the results, we have economic losses, uh, loss of life, we have loss of the different return periods, average annual losses. There's a lot of data there. How could we communicate that with a single product? So we produced uh, what we call the seismic risk index. So this takes the average annual losses, both economic and loss of life, and we normalize them um, so that they can be combined and summed together. And then we also disaggregate them onto a high resolution grid. So we do disaggregate the results so that they can so they're all in the same resolution. And then we divide the, that, that combined metric of average annual losses by the GDP per capita. So we've collected GDP per capita data at the highest resolution at which we were able to obtain it across, across Europe. And so this is, um, in some ways, an, ind an indicator of resilience of the, the, of the area, um, of the ability to the area to recover, to, to absorb the, those losses that, that that are occurring uh, according to the, the seismic hazard. This is a very crude um, a param parameter of resilience, and uh, I hope in the, in the next presentations we'll be looking into how we can model resilience and recovery, obviously, in a much uh, th more thorough manner. But this was just to at least account for the fact that the average annual losses in two different locations in Europe are not necessarily having the same impact. It doesn't mean that there's the same level of risk because some countries can. Um, cope with those losses much better than others. And this is how we obtain this final relative seismic risk index, which goes from very low to very high. Um, we have posters, if you're interested, of, of the European seismic risk and hazard maps now. You, you maybe some of you have the map, the GSHAP map from uh, 20 plus years ago, or even the, the share hazard map. Now we have uh, um, updated maps and a new one for risk, and you can download them from the FAIR website. Um, Laurentia already mentioned uh, the, the fact that we release everything with open licenses. Everything is all um, assigned a, a, what's called a, a CC BY license. So that all that means you can you can use it for any purpose, commercial, non-commercial, as long as you give attribution or you, you credit the, the source of that, of that data. Um, and we also, as I mentioned at the beginning, we spent a lot of time on communication material. We have flyers, fact sheets, videos, 
um, interactive map, and many of that, much of that material is, is uh, translated into different languages. We have nine European languages, and some of you uh, helped us to, to translate into the languages also in this region. So thank you very much for that. And if you do have any uh, questions, we don't have time to answer them, but I'm going to be here for two days, so I hope we will. But we have an email address where you can send further questions. So thank you very much. of exposure is obviously a very important uh, problem and I think Rosa in his presentation, presentation maybe he mentioned the, the RISE project and in particular in that project we're working with colleagues at GFZ who are using OpenStreetMap to produce, um, a, a, it's actually a global exposure database so there you have building by building data and it's also dynamic because as changes are made people, it's crowdsourcing information on buildings, people are updating that database. And the problem with it is that you, you, there's many areas which are incomplete, there's many areas which are missing. And so what we're doing is we're, we're combining this more statistics-based model, where you have for a given administrative region, you just have statistics on the buildings, with this more detailed building by building, hoping that with time, obviously, the, the, the statistics part will reduce and reduce and we can rely more on the the dynamics, but this is a, a product which is coming out of that project and, and hopefully will, will be available soon. And then you, you talk about sustainability and how can we continue to maintain. I mean, this is one of the main objectives of AFAIR, so the European Facilities for Earthquake Hazard and Risk. And so, if there, we, we hope to have more partners join that uh, consortium. So, if there are people here, there are groups here that would like to be more involved and 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 as you're mentioning a problem of communication and understanding what we're doing, I think joining that community would be the best way to, to learn more. We have uh, regular meetings, we're starting now to have more regular workshops, um, and we, we've only just, if you like, wrapped up these models. We, we haven't yet started this process of maintaining, of, of updating. This is now where we will start to understand how we're going to do that, and having your input and how this, the best way that we can do that would be very useful as well. First one is uh, when you de uh, develop the uh, fortuity and vulnerability models, uh, do you consider any kind of uh, ground barrier detection and uh, any kind of phenomena related to, to the ground? Uh, because, uh, okay, not, not the coincidence, but uh, uh, the places that are most vulnerable uh, to earthquakes also uh, affected by liquefaction, uh, for example, Albania. Some parts of the Danube Valley in Romania, also Turkey. Uh, and my other question is uh, the both in terms of uh, exposure and uh, loss values, uh, do you, do, does your model uh, consider only like buildings, uh, but, but also uh, facilities like industrial facilities, Wi Fi, uh, critical facilities maybe? Uh, and also, if the, um, these are included in the, the with direct and indirect uh, uh, losses in the in the loss model. Okay, thank yeah. you. So um, on the first question, which is um, on ground failure, so we, we have not in Europe, at least in this model, addressed that. GEM, the Global Earthquake Model, is looking at, uh, at that in more detail. They are looking at um, 
models to assess the, the ground failure hazard at, at, at a large scale. Obviously, when you're looking at a small scale, especially for liquefaction, quite detailed information that you need, you can do it at a, a small scale, but at, at a large scale, it becomes more difficult. But the Open Quake engine does now have the methods to assess this, the data is being collected, and they are looking at that and from the hazard point of view, from the vulnerability point of view. There are some studies, I feel it's an area where there could be a lot more done to assess fragility functions for liquefaction, um, landslides, uh, and other ground failure. So, um, actually, in my PhD, I did something, some very early work on this, but uh, and there have been some, some more studies, but I feel like the, there isn't a, if you like, a, a clear method that's agreed in the community on how we should produce fragility functions for ground failure. Um, the hazards also has some very simple uh, models, but um, I, think, I think this could be an area where we could definitely work in the future in Europe. Yeah. And then, um, but the second question was, uh, is it just buildings? Yes, we, in, currently in the model it's just residential, industrial and commercial buildings. And by industrial we don't mean large industrial facilities, but we mean more um, warehouses and industrial buildings. So at the moment it's just industrial, but obviously this is an area where, again, linking up with a more dynamic exposure, open street map, the, the, um, uh, those data sets do have um, critical infrastructure, schools, hospitals, these types of buildings, we need to sort of classify them as well in the model and, and include those. So. And, and the losses are only direct losses? Direct, it's only direct, so it's only losses that are directly associated with the damage right now, yes. Today, 1 p.m., I have one important meeting related to official uh, disaster risk register of the Republic of Serbia. No. These things you talk about, schools and critical infrastructure, are going to be. The idea is to be inside if we have data. I mean, probably we don't have. But uh, my question to you is this is a EU funded project, and when I asked to gather some data, they said we need official data from the official institutions of Republic of Serbia related to floods from the Serbia waters related to seismicity for the seismical survey. Uh, what is the way for data from the, your website to be official? Is there any, do you have any uh, experience how that data to be the official data of some particular country, government, and so on? Or it is a parallel process because you compare some results from the, our website or the, and your website, there are some discrepancies, of course. So I want to put it in the disaster risk register, but which one to use? Well, I think when you're working at the national scale, you really should always use the national, the national data. I think uh, also that it's Maybe I have more believe in your data, for example. And, and what? Sorry. Maybe if I maybe more believe in your data, maybe it's, it's harmonized. Maybe the methodologies. Well, we we, we uh, yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to <laughs> comment on that, but. Um, I can comment on the other aspect where maybe you believe more in your national data that we're very happy to update our model to, to match more closely your national data. But um, yeah, I, haven't, I don't have any experience or ideas of how you could get our data. In any case, that your data became official data for any country or not? We, we certainly we, we don't want to promote that. We're, we're just promoting the, the use of this data at, at European scale. And so we always say that when you're at your national scale, you really should go to your national data set. But um, we, we can talk about this afterwards if we, we, have to, if we come up with any ideas. Well, I think there is also a time when you thank Helen once again for an excellent presentation. And I'll just make a few announcements. Thank you.